Hi, I'm Randy Reed, editor of Design and Lighting Magazine, and I am joined today by Martin Lupton and Sharon Stammers of the Light Collective in the UK. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Hi, Randy. Well, thank you. So we are here in Tuscany in a beautiful 1,200-year-old monastery. And tell our audience, what are we doing here? We are holding a workshop uh, for lighting designers um, using the village as a background for a sort of living lab and exploration of light. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good idea. The idea for it being in Tuscany is because this is a really area of remote dark sky um, space. So we've got lots of dark sky and the idea is that the workshop talks about how to light heritage buildings whilst preserving connection with dark sky. Let's talk a little bit about the inspiration of going dark. And I heard you speak this morning about an event that you hosted in Las Vegas at Light Fair. Mm -hmm. Tell our audience a little bit about that. <laughs> uh, you you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was, it, we decided that we wanted to take people who were at Light Fair. It was part of the Professional Lighting Design Association at the time. It was an event we did with them or for them. And we basically put about 60 or 70 lighting designers onto a bus. We drove them just the other side of the Las Vegas, just out in the mountains into the desert. Probably Red Rock, I guess. I, I don't know where. Um, we don't really know where it was, <laughs> but we went there. We went to a campsite. There was a fire. There was some barbecue. We had some local astronomers there with us. And they'd set up telescopes. And uh, if you looked one way, it was beautiful, starry sky. It was amazing. It was fantastic to see. And then if you looked the other way, you could see the glow of Las Vegas coming over the mountains and the, the Luxor beam firing up into the sky. It was just, it was incredible, really. But we should say that was in conjunction with Glenn Schramm from Parsons. Yes, yes. Yeah. We know Glenn well. Yeah. yeah. When was this? What year? Oh, I was, I'm thinking 15 years ago. Okay, so 15 years ago, you were really out there, right? People weren't designing with dark in mind 15 years ago. I, th I think probably there were groups of designers around the world that yeah. were very conscious of it. I think the manufacturers were slightly behind on that. Um, would you say that's that's correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah they were, I mean, we had people there with us from like Nordic countries because it was PLDA. It, there was right. a combination of European and American lighting designers. And lots of the, the Nordic lighting designers, Kai Pippo, for example, they were all sort of really used to dark sky scenarios because they lived in Finland, Sweden, <laughs> places like that. And they were conscious of it, but it was nowhere near the movement it is now. And dark sky uh, as an organisation has got a lot more traction, become something that's on everyone's lips. Yeah. A lot of manufacturers in the last five years are producing, you know, special dark sky optics or right. colour temperatures that are you know, much more suited to outdoor lighting. Um, things like Roland happening or even Alan. Yeah. Um, all the acronyms. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I know, wait, back up. <laughs> I know Roland. Okay. I know what that is. And we've got that in the magazine. Yeah. What is Alan and Alice? Okay, I'll let you do that. So Alan is artificial light at night and Alice is artificial light in coastal environments. Okay. Well done. This, this is one of the things that... Um, again, was mentioned last year in the conference in, in Dubai, like Middle East where you were, um, that with regards to dark sky, there's almost too much information. So when you get politicians trying to gather information and make a decision or create laws and legislations, in the UK, the feedback that came back from the politicians, from the government, was that there's too much information. We don't know which bit to look at. So that's one of the issues I think that this subject's facing. Like, how do we drill it down right. into a common set of accepted action standards? And that's where Roland, yeah. Alan, and Alice come in. I, th I, I don't. I don't Alan, even know they're connected. Uh, they're not connected really. Roland was an initiative to try and do that. Okay. Responsible outdoor lighting at night, bring everything together. Alan was, I believe, a series of conferences mm. it started as. It was a, an organisation to talk about artificial light at night. And then Alice might have even been Australian, but I'm not sure. 
just came about yeah. to focus on the specific coastal. issues of coastal environments? There was a meet-up um, at the ILD conference in June in London with uh, sort of dark sky representatives, um, Paulina Villalobos Paulina from yeah. Chile and um, uh, Andrew Bissell in the UK and people that have been really working in this area. And sort of the, the, the upshot of the big conversation is that all over the world, everybody's trying to do things, but we would be so much stronger if we spoke with a collective voice, if we could somehow okay. pull everything together. And? What were the results of that? Well, it's it's yeah. the beginning of the conversation. That was the right? beginning of the conversation. Yeah. The result is a small working group. They formed a small working yeah. group that is just okay. getting underway with representatives of ILD and the Dark Sky, trying to work together to create something that that forms this common link. Like a definite, that sort of almost a definitive guide. Yeah, sort of. yeah. But I think one of the things that has changed over the last few years, which is really good is it used to be astronomers seeing lighting people as the, the enemy. Oh, yes. Uh, mm. And now I think... And, and vice versa to some yeah, extent. Yeah, 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 to yeah, some yeah. extent. And absolutely vice versa. And now I think what Doc Sky are sort of promoting and realising is the actually responsible use of light. So professionals, professionally designed light, is actually the thing that will right. change, that will make the difference. Well, that's one thing Alessandro Marchini, the astronomer here, both that's based in Siena, said yesterday at Going Dark, I need your help to right. protect the sky. So he, he yeah. understands the need for light, mm. but also he's sort of imploring us to help with um, how we work. So we have divided into, into four groups, and I'm in the group working on the apps. And of course, I'm not very productive because I'm talking to you while the rest of the group, and I don't have the knowledge that they have, but it's going very well. Tell our audience a little bit about the logistics of this. Okay, so it's a very, it's a very small village, but um, it has a lot of character. So we picked uh, four different sites that we thought would enable the participants to demonstrate some different lighting techniques. We are, uh, one is the cloister of the monastery, one is the facade of the church behind us. We have the apse of the church and we have uh, the village square. And uh, the groups have been paired with uh, each one of our sponsors. Um, so we have Lead Linear VF, we have Simmers, we have Lucien Light and we have Thorn. Um, and they have spent uh, several hours uh, testing product, um, playing with product, dimming, controlling, mm. changing colour temperature, shielding, and working out really the most optimum way to light those areas. Yeah. I think it, what was really important was the control element of that as well. So there's a company called Dalknet who fitted um, every light that we've got in the in the in the in the workshop with a kasambi based control so everything on it can be dimmed so that these guys can really go out there experiment lower the light level get just the right amount of light in the right place at the right time and they've also been supported by studio due who are a um, technical company, they've handled the installation, they've put out the plugs, the wiring, the infrastructure, so that the participants can really get down to the detail of playing with light. Well, I'm with the group that's working on the apps, and what was amazing to me, not only are we controlling the intensity of the light, but through apps are also controlling the color. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I was just amazed because they talked about the color blue in a window. What? No, nobody mm -hmm. wants that. The second they put that on, it's like, oh my goodness, it looks incredible. And in my mind, I couldn't see it, but once we did it, it was fantastic. And then they're also changing the aperture of the lens mm -hmm. and going from wide shots to narrow just on the app. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you talk about being able to use the benefits of technology and see it real time it makes a huge difference. I guess that's where we might really win against the fight against yes. light pollution as uh, products become more sophisticated and that technology is more widely available we can control the lighting much better. Um, I mean, it's available as professionals. If that was available in the high street, yeah, well, it, it might change yeah, the world. I think you're right. It's becoming so much more available because we've shifted to LED as right. a profession. Yeah. It is now dimmable, color temperature changeable, 
fittings are small and can have really precise beams. Some of the technology that the guys are showing, the precision yeah. that's available in the optics is incredible, and that's right. what we need. But now it's up to the education. Yeah. yeah. And I think that yeah. is the key. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the big points is that there's only a small percentage of lighting worldwide that's done by professional lighting designers probably 90 percent maybe even more of the lighting that's installed out in the wild out in the world right. is just by anybody right. somebody puts a fitting on the house electrical contractor puts up what they got from the wholesaler for the cheapest so getting this message across right. about good optical control warm white light switching off when you don't need it dimming down yeah. that's that's this that's going to be the the key to the I was just going to say, last night we stepped away from the village and walked off into the fields. Oh. And when we looked back onto Abadia, all of the lights were out because we had control of everything. So we turned everything off. And you could, the, the road lighting and the lighting on some of the houses, quite in the distance, was so bright, so glary, <laughs> so awful, compared to this very, very subtle, low-level glow here. Yeah. And I think it was proven last night with the, the group working here at such a low level of light that when the clouds cleared, we could see the sky. Right. So the point, the yes. point was just there. Yeah. This was lit. Yeah. This facade here was lit, but we could see that sky. Tell our audience a little bit about the Light Collective, because you guys are involved in so many things, I can't keep up with it. Uh, I, <laughs> well, think about it. You have a lighting design practice. You're responsible for women in lighting. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. You're responsible for this. What else? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working with lots of different people to, to do events. We sort of help like Middle East curate their conference in January. The thing we're going to next week is, is our, new, our new initiative that we can barely keep up with. It's called Disruption. So next week we're bringing um, maybe 150, 200 lighting designers together in a, in a secret location in South London. And we're bringing in people to talk about AI, neuroarchitecture, the metaverse, uh, the metaverse, experiential sort of immersive design, immersive technologies, um, all sorts of exciting things. All yes. this sort of stuff that is potentially there going to disrupt the lighting industry. Right. We're trying to bring in all the different influencers to talk about that. So yeah, but I think Light Collective is. It sounds like there's lots of us, but literally, like collective is me and Sharon. Yeah. It's not really a collective. And and Magali in Mexico. And we've, we've expanded. We've, now we've got we've Magali, who we're working with in right. Mexico, and she's helping us with the event in London. So. And there was a book. Didn't you? You published a book. We published a book about women light artists. That right. was back. Two uh, years ago. Two years ago. Nearly two years ago. But our second book is coming out in October. It focuses on women in entertainment. October of 25? Design. No, now. This month? Yeah. You mean okay. in, a, in a couple of weeks? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. In a couple of weeks. <laughs> it should have been delivered Thank on you. Monday in a big box. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that focus hey, on. It, what is it? It focuses on women working in stage, TV, concert, uh, um, all of those live events um, because that's an industry that has very few women in lighting. Sure. So it's really, really sort of uh, trying to celebrate those women that have achieved amazing things. And we can get it on Amazon? You will be able to get it on Amazon, yes. Yeah. No, it's not yet. I haven't okay. transferred it across. But uh, yeah, it'll be available on Amazon. But there are some other books coming after that. We found so many other women working with light art in the world that we have a, a volume to oh, follow the first wait. one. I can't wait. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thanks.